money, money she had inherited. Then nine years later, in 1952, she bought herself a television station. It was in Austin. It was called KTBC. It was the very first television, television station in Central Texas. The tallest structure in Central Texas. That's the distinction of this tower of steel. But this structure is much more than cold steel. It's music and laughter and tears and parades and sports and a thousand things. This is a magic wand that cast its spell through the air and onto the screen of your television set. This is a transmitter tower of KTBC TV. Oh, news writing used to be better. <laughs> but that uh, radio station and that TV station would go on to earn Lady Bird and Lyndon Johnson millions of dollars. Texas Broadcasting gave the Johnson family their family fortune. And when John F. Kennedy was assassinated and LBJ became president unexpectedly in 1963, he and his wife changed their financial life because he was now president. Uh, they decided to put their Texas radio and broadcast holdings into a blind trust to avoid any appearance of a conflict of interest. And that makes sense. They owned and profited from assets that were regulated by the federal government while he was now running the federal government. Ever since then, presidents have been setting up blind trusts, with very few exceptions. Jimmy Carter did it, Ronald Reagan did it, both Presidents Bush did it, Bill Clinton did it. They all put their assets into blind trusts to avoid a potential conflict of interest upon assuming the presidency. Last night on this show, we previewed a Newsweek story that was due to come out today, looking at Donald Trump's myriad foreign assets and his business ties to people and, and other businesses in multiple foreign countries. Newsweek has st since published that story. It's a cover story. It's a lengthy examination of Trump's business empire, how his foreign ties could be problematic if he were elected president. You should read the story. It's good. It's well written. Um, but the author, Kurt Eichenwald's bottom line is basically this. If Donald Trump wins this election and his company is not immediately shut down or forever severed from the Trump family, the foreign policy of the United States of America could well be for sale. It's not because he's a rich guy. We have had rich presidential nominees before. You might remember a lot of focus on Mitt Romney's richness and his foreign investments and his blind trusts four years ago, right? In the 2004 election, Dick Cheney was still answering questions about his ongoing ties to Halliburton, the oil services company where he served as CEO before becoming vice president, from which he deferred nearly $2 million in earnings during his time in the White House. We've had rich guys before, plenty of them, but we've never had a nominee like Donald Trump with a sprawling, ongoing business empire involving not just financial holdings, but hotels and golf courses and licensing deals, and all of them tied together with ongoing relationships and ongoing deals and ongoing financial transactions. The question of how Donald Trump would manage this problem, the potential conflicts from this problem, it did come up at one of the primary debates. Are you planning on putting your assets in a blind trust should you become president? If I become president, I couldn't care less about my company. It's peanuts I want to make. I want to use that same up here, whatever it may be, to make America rich again and to make America great again. I have Ivanka and Eric and Don sitting there. Run the company, kids. Have a good time. I'm going to do it for America. <laughs> so I would, I would be willing to do it. So you'll put your assets in a blind trust? I would put it in a blind trust. Well, I don't know if it's a blind trust if Ivanka, Don, and Eric run it, but is that a blind trust? I don't know. But I would probably have my children run it with my executives, and I wouldn't ever be involved because I wouldn't care about anything but our country. Anything. Thank you, sir. It's like, it's like it's a laugh line. Well, I don't know if it's a blind trust if Ivanka and Don and Eric are running it. You tell me. Well, I don't know. You know, on that point, <laughs> on that point, Donald Trump actually is in agreement with Kurt Eichenwald, who just wrote this Newsweek cover story. Also, the White House chief ethics lawyer for President George W. Bush, who tells The Wall Street Journal, quote, a blind trust would never work in Trump's case because his assets are known. They're not blind and children are not independent trustees. You can see the problem here, right? I mean, the problem here is that the Trump organization and, and uh, the Trump organization is an ongoing concern. The possibility that President Trump's actions as president could benefit the Trump organization and thereby him or his family, yeah, blind trust won't cut it. And neither will his kids running it instead of him running it. I mean, all the conflicts would still be there, right? We all get that, right? Everybody's on the same page about that, right?
we can say, you know what, we're going to do less deals. We're not going to do that deal, even though it's a fine deal, it's economically reasonable, because it could create a conflict of interest, and we'll act incredibly responsibly. My father already said that he would put the company into a blind trust, okay. and it would be run by us. Um, so he's been very articulate on that fact and outspoken. It would be run by us. Problem solved, right? We'll be incredibly responsible. Everybody good with that? This is actually is a really big one, uh, and this one's going to need a real answer. There's so much going on in the news right now. There's so much going on even just in the, in the political campaign. Um, but the Trump campaign has basically created a circus around the issue of their candidate's health. Um, and I'm sorry to say, well, I don't know if I'm sorry, but I feel like I should at least fess up to the fact that I think the first tent of that circus, the first ring of that three ring circus, may have been put up um, by me uh, here on this show. So Mr. Trump personally um, and your campaign, members of your campaign, have repeatedly now raised this question of Secretary Clinton's health. Now, the only testimony we have of Mr. Trump's health is this letter from his gastroenterologist saying that his lab results were astonishingly excellent. And it, it, the letter ends by saying, if elected, Mr. Trump, I can state unequivocally, will be the healthiest individual ever elected to the presidency. And that's really funny, but as a doctor's letter, it's a, it's a little bit absurd. It's just, it's, an, it's a non-serious letter. It's, it's full of typos, it's hyperbolic, it's unprofessional. A lot, most of the letter has no medical meaning. It links to a website that doesn't exist. Um, if he was elected, Donald Trump would be the oldest person to ever be sworn in as president. Whether or not he's gonna try to make Hillary Clinton out the issue, doesn't he, owe it to the American people to release an actual, an actual medical report, a more credible, more complete statement. Perhaps, but I want to say something about Hillary Clinton's health. It's not an issue that I care to comment on because I'm not a doctor, she's not my patient, and I can just tell you what I see with my own two eyes, which is I don't see someone who really enjoys campaigning the way he does. But Hillary Clinton released a normal doctor statement. Um, what we've got from Donald Trump, that, re that letter really is absurd. I mean, for one, why is, why is a gastroenterologist is a digestive specialist? Why has Donald Trump been seeing a gastroenterologist for 35 years? Oh, that like, I don't know for sure. Uh, okay, I mean, there are certain things I just didn't learn in the last week, Rachel, I promise. Yeah, but, I will. but like, can't, as, your, as the campaign manager, yes. can I please make a request to you that please. we get Absolutely. a more a more substantial medical I will pass statement. on the request, and okay. I assure you that he does have doctors. He has doctors and physicians. He has doctors. He has doctors and physicians, both kinds. That was August 24th on this show. The Trump campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, is a very nice person, uh, telling me that, yes, perhaps, that was her words, perhaps Donald Trump should release more complete medical information. That was August 24th. Two days later, August 26th, NBC News snagged an interview with Donald Trump's doctor, his gastroenterologist, who did write that, in my words, absurd letter that Trump had circulated as the only um, uh, statement about his health. And in that interview on the 26th of August, Donald Trump's gastroenterologist admitted that he wrote that letter in about five minutes while a car idled outside waiting for him to produce it. He also admitted that he had uh, standard concerns about Donald Trump's health that you would have for any 70-year-old man. He said some of the more over-the-top statements in that letter, at least one of them, the astonishingly excellent lab results, that was intended as a joke. Two days after that, August 28th, Donald Trump himself tweeted that he agreed he should release more detailed medical records. Then a week later, on September 5th, Donald Trump told ABC News that he would even go first. He would release more information about his own health, whether or not Hillary Clinton did as well. You're 70, she's 68. Do you think the American people deserve to know more about both of you and your medical Sure, history? I do. But I would love to give specifics as far as I'm concerned. And if she wants to do it, I'll do it 100%. Why not go first? I might do that. I might do that. In fact, now that you ask, I think I will do that. You will? Yeah. Now that you ask, you know what? Uh, by the end of um, that week, but, but, which is last week, uh, we got this announcement from this daytime TV show, The Dr. Oz Show, announcing that Donald Trump would be appearing on that daytime TV show with that TV doctor uh, to talk about Mr. Trump's health. 
Yesterday, the host of that daytime talk show, Dr. Oz, went on Fox News Radio and said Trump would be actually handing over his medical records to Dr. Oz, to the host of that TV show, live on TV. The medical records would be revealed on TV. Then, interestingly, this morning, that was off. The Trump campaign telling reporters they had basically changed their minds. They would not be handing over Trump's medical records on the daytime TV show. In fact, frankly, that's a ridiculous suggestion. Why would you even say we could consider that? Now, John Roberts just reported a little while ago that he's going to go on Dr. Oz today, but that he is not going to release uh, the results of his physical. Why is that? On a TV show? I don't think that he should but be. that was the original plan, wasn't it? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yes. The Trump campaign um, followed that up today, uh, that appearance by the campaign manager this morning on Fox. No, that was never the plan. We were never going to do that. Followed that up by insisting to reporters that, yeah, in no uncertain terms, Donald Trump was not going to release his medical records or his lab results or the results of his physical on that TV talk show. No way, not happening. And then today, while taping the TV show, sure enough, Donald Trump went on that TV talk show and surprise, with a flourish, he handed over what he said were his medical records or at least the description of how he did at his recent physical. I don't know. I don't know what they were. We don't know. No reporters were at the taping. Nothing has been released publicly. We are told that what he handed over on TV is another one-page medical summary from our old friend Dr. Bornstein. Who knows? I don't know if the same caveats apply. I'm not sure if there are jokes in this one, too. We can report tonight that the host of the TV show, Dr. Mehmet Oz, had in fact never seen whatever that document was before Donald Trump showed it to him on the set of his TV show. So it's not like he did a you know, big background check or a lot of reading about what he had found or anything. The Clinton campaign told us tonight that in their view, the whole spectacle that Donald Trump has created around this whole issue uh, is, in their words, ridiculous. Um, according to the Clinton campaign, Donald Trump is, quote, making a mockery of this. And so, ultimately, uh, bottom line, we've still got nothing. Um, and maybe we shouldn't care. But the Trump campaign remains the only presidential campaign in U.S. history to have made such a, such a hash and such a bizarre spectacle out of what is usually a totally run-of-the-mill part of the presidential campaign. And, you know, there's all these serious concerns swirling around the Donald Trump Foundation and how truthful Trump and his campaign have been about that foundation and whose money that foundation is giving away anyway. And with this new damning report in Newsweek on Trump's financial entanglements through his business and whether those might be prohibitively conflicting for him and his family if he were elected president, unless he drastically severed himself from his life's work and his business interests, with all this serious stuff out there about Trump, with him even today just basically getting the hook and getting yanked off stage in Flint, Michigan tonight by that pastor. I mean, with all that stuff going on, you know what? If you're a real showman, if you're good at being a showman, you can distract from all that and more with a little bread and circus. A real showman can convince people they have seen something even if they have not actually seen it. There has been no release of information about Donald Trump's health. Nobody other than that guy on TV has seen anything new about Donald Trump's health today, even though a lot of people have now convinced themselves that he's made some new disclosure about his health. A great showman can pick something, pick any one thing, and be so ridiculous about it that everybody stops whatever else they were paying attention to before and pays attention to that ridiculous circus instead. And not only do we pay attention, we pay for the privilege of paying attention to it. That's what showmanship is. It's a con, but it's very compelling. This is a weird day in the news, but a lot of what happened in today's news makes me feel like I need to wash. We'll be right back. Why not share your medical records? Why not? Well, I have really no problem in doing it. I, I have it right here. I mean, I, should I do it? I don't care. Should I do it? Hillary failed on the economy, just like she's failed on foreign policy. Everything she touched didn't work out. Nothing. Now Hillary Clinton. Oh, 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 okay. 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 That's good. Pretty incredible moment in Flint, Michigan earlier today. Joining us now is the mayor of Flint, Karen Weaver. Uh, mayor Weaver, it's really nice to see you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. 
So you got a, you're getting a new burst of national attention in Flint for a few different reasons. Number one is <laughs> this federal lawsuit that's going on right now, people testifying from Flint today in federal court. Um, we've got the Senate bill, which hopefully will become yes. the House bill if the Senate passes this thing. On top of that, you had this visit from a presidential candidate today um, that it seems like you were a little bit blindsided by. Am I right in thinking that you didn't know that this Trump visit was on its way? That's exactly right. We were blindsided. We got the information I found out actually yesterday is when I was mm. informed that he would be coming to the city of Flint and wanted to do different uh, drive-bys to see what was going on at different locations. And so that's, that's what we were talking about. We were just saying it was a little inconvenient uh, not to be notified earlier about what he wanted to do and, and kind of thoughtless. In terms of... Um I guess the utility of national attention. You have talked mm -hmm. in the past about, you know, the spotlight being helpful and it being something that does get things moving in Flint. How, how are you feeling right now about the prospects of national assistance, federal assistance? Obviously, it's moving right now in the Senate. It's not a done deal, but it's been moving. The, the House is something that seems like much more of an unknown quantity in terms of getting that right. federal help. Right, but we're very, you know, today was a really good day. Mm. And it's something we've been waiting for for a long time, but we are making steps in the right direction. It was nice to come and meet with the Michigan delegation. They've been working tirelessly to get things moving for the city of Flint. And uh, we see that it's happening in the Senate. And so really what we need to have happen now is for things to move in Congress. That's what we need. We need that federal assistance. It means a lot to the people of the city of Flint when you look at what, what's in there for infrastructure and when you look at what's in there for health care and, and for loan forgiveness. That's really, really vital to what we need in the city of Flint. Congressman Kildee um, made an interesting comment to the free press. He said mm -hmm. on the occasion of this photo off of if Donald Trump wants to wants to help with Flint, what he should do is one simple thing that's very doable. He should call Paul Ryan and tell that, Paul Ryan that Paul Ryan right. should help Flint. You agree with that? That's absolutely right. And that's what we were talking about. You know, help us that way. If you want to help Flint, if you care and you're concerned about the citizens of Flint, then talk to your Republican colleagues in the House and, and get this passed there. That's what we need to have happen. I have a feeling, actually, that that advice not, might not only apply to, to Donald Trump, that uh, Paul Ryan may, may need to hear from a lot of people uh, on this. <laughs> Mayor Karen Weaver of Flint, Michigan, I really appreciate uh, your time tonight. Continued good luck to you, ma'am. It's nice to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Ready? Set? Run. Everybody run. Run. Run across the lawn of the Flint, Michigan water treatment plant. Uh, the reason our poor camera crew is in such a hurry running across the lawn with all the other reporters and photographers uh, is because Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump was there today for a tour of the plant. Um, the mayor of Flint, Michigan, last night tried to discourage Donald Trump from visiting Flint. She put out a statement last night that said this, quote, neither Donald Trump nor any staff members from the Trump campaign have ever reached out since the Flint water crisis was officially recognized as an emergency in December 2015. Quote, city of Flint employees are focused on dealing with the continued contamination in the drinking water and cannot afford the disruption of a last minute visit. Despite those essentially warnings from the mayor, there was Donald Trump today uh, surveying machinery at the Flint water plant. Um, machinery that has not been in use since last fall because the plant isn't either. After that, he then left for Bethel United Memor Methodist Church in Flint. Bethel United Methodist is, is one of the churches in Flint that has worked to get water and healthy food to the people of Flint since the town's water was poisoned with lead more than two years ago now. Ahead of Mr. Trump's visit to the church today, Pastor Faith Green Timmons put out a statement explaining um, what this event with Trump was going to be and, and what it would not be. Quote, we pass out water and lead mitigating food items in response to the Flint water crisis to assist area residents. This public event is open to all, and today Donald Trump came to observe. Trump's presence at Bethel United Methodist in no way represents an endorsement of his candidacy. What we pray is that it conveys a fine example of a faithful, intelligent, historically African-American congregation at work, serving and volunteering among the people of Flint as we work through this crisis of national impact. Uh, I do not know whether Mr. Trump got that memo from Pastor Timmons ahead of his visit to her church, but I definitely think he got her message later on, mid-speech. Watch this. China now, you look at what's going on, a trade deficit of 500 
billion dollars. Hillary failed on the economy just like she's failed on foreign policy. Everything she touched didn't work out. Nothing. Now Hillary Clinton. Mr. Trump, I invited you here to thank us for Oh, 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 okay. Okay. That's okay. That's good. Okay, 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 that's good. After uh, Pastor Timmons uh, got up, stopped him from what he was doing, got him back on track, uh, Donald Trump ended up wrapping up his uh, remarks right quick, wrapped him up in about 90 seconds thereafter. In that remaining time, the pastor also shut down some uh, people who were, by that point, heckling Mr. Trump on this visit. Um, and then at the end, she basically ushered him off the stage, which may have been the day's uh, great mercy for him. For all that Donald Trump put himself in the position of, of a speechifying to people living through a disaster, he may have missed the big news of the day concerning Flint. Today in federal court, Flint residents suing to try to get some relief. They pleaded to a federal judge today that they, they still need very, very basic relief. You still cannot drink from the tap in Flint after all this time. Flint residents involved in this federal lawsuit today in federal court asked the federal government to step in and start bringing water door to door to the people of that city because I know you don't believe it, but that is still not happening. They're still not bringing water door to door in Flint even now. That said, the U.S. Congress may finally be on the verge of doing something to help Flint replace its ruined pipes. The Senate has been advancing this bill this week with, with almost no opposition. Um, the final vote may happen as soon as tomorrow. The question then is whether the Republican-controlled House could be persuaded to sign on to this water infrastructure bill. Dan Kildee, the feisty Democratic congressman from Flint, told the Free Press today that if Donald Trump really wants to help Flint, he could, quote, pick up the phone and call Paul Ryan and tell him to do something about Flint. If the Senate passed this thing and if Paul Ryan could be persuaded that the House should pass it too, that really could be a big deal in the making for Flint. That could be millions of dollars for infrastructure in Flint and for the health care needs of kids who were poisoned in Flint through no fault of their own. Millions and millions and millions of dollars for Flint at stake. Donald Trump does not appear to have mentioned that or even understood it was happening, either in his photo op at the closed water plant today or in his unintentionally abbreviated remarks at the church. With less than 60 days to go before the election, Donald Trump toured Flint, Michigan, which has been plagued by a public health crisis ever since lead was discovered. Of course, we all know this story in the city's drinking water. Rachel's done great work on this back in 2014. Of course, at a campaign event back in January, Trump was asked about Flint, but he didn't. Well, he said he didn't want to comment on it. But Monday, he told the Detroit News, quote, this is a situation that would never have happened if I were president. He doesn't explain how, in fact. Both the mayor of Flint, Karen Weaver, who's with me right now, and Michigan senior Senate Debbie Stabenow have called this a belated photo op, accusing the Republican nominee of exploiting the crisis. Hillary Clinton, by the way, made, a Flint, made Flint a focal point of her campaign during the primaries. She's visited the city twice. Trump's visit is aimed at reaching out to communities with large African-American populations, of course. And joining me right now is Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow, the aforementioned, and also the aforementioned Flint's Deputy, actually, Democratic Mayor Karen Weaver. So what do you think? I mean, Michael, uh, Michael, what's it? Michael Moore is one of these guys who's been out there in that city for decades talking uh -huh. about its economic plight. What do you make of the newbie? Well, you know what? Uh, Does it help at all? Well, the, the only good thing is there's a tension on Flint, yeah. and we want to keep this story front and center because it doesn't need to go away until the issue is resolved. But this, this emergency declaration was declared back in December of 15. Yeah. Back in December, so that's almost 10 months now. And to come into Flint now, you know, it's, it's interesting timing because it's almost time for people to start getting absentee ballots. Yeah. It's time for the it's vote. Fine, it's funny time. We know the politics. Right, Mr. right, Mr. right. Mayor, we are familiar here at Hardball <laughs> with politics. But let me ask you this, just so people know who do care, and you raise that point. Mm -hmm. uh, the water now that the people are getting out of their taps. Right. In their bathrooms, and especially their kitchens, that water that comes out, is that got lead in it? The water is still unsafe for us to drink, okay. yes. So you're still uh, while water is water getting better, it. it's not at a point where we can drink it. We are still on bottled water and filtered water. Okay. And just think about that, Chris. I mean, we're talking about going on two years of folks that have been mm -hmm. bathing in bottled water and, and cooking and are still drinking bottled water. The good news is that today in the United States Senate, we finally broke uh, the gridlock and the, the roadblock for the last eight months, and we are providing help uh, that will help fix those pipes and replace those pipes. Uh, but I want to go back but to that. that's what you have to do, right? You, know, you have pipes to replace the pipes. Yeah, absolutely. All the pipes leading right into your house or right. the ones on the... On the, right. the 
the, right. the mains, you know, all the right. pipes. Well, and the thing is that I mean, seriously, it wouldn't have been trained. You have to get rid of your own plumbing. Right. And the right. reason that was done is because the governor of the state wouldn't spend $100 yeah. a day to treat the water for corrosion. And so that's how we got we here. Got through. We covered that here. While in Flint, by right. the way, Donald Trump today visited the Bethel United Methodist Church. He also delivered some prepared remarks. But when he began attacking Hillary Clinton... The pastor of that church stepped in to clarify the purpose of his visit and the invitation to come in. Let's listen to the pastor. Everything she touched didn't work out. Nothing. Now Hillary Clinton. Mr. Trump, I invited this. you here to thank us for what oh, we Oh, 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 okay. Not okay. give a political speech. Okay. What you think of that? She was quick off her feet, wasn't she? She was very, she was, she <laughs> was very great. You know, that's right. Yeah. That was, that's the kind of moderator, by the way, yeah. they don't want in the debates. Anyway, yeah. Trump yeah. also promised, if elected, to help the city. Here he is. The damage can be corrected, and it can be corrected by people that know what they're doing. Uh, unfortunately, the people that caused this pro tremendous problem had no clue. They had absolutely no clue. So... It's an honor to be with you, Pastor. It's an honor to be with you, and I appreciate it, Armstrong. And I will say, I can, I can only say in the strongest of terms that uh, we can fix this problem. It's going to take time. It's amazing the damage that's been done. But we'll get it fixed, and it will be fixed quickly if I'm elected. Uh, let's talk politics for a second here, right? You're both politicians. You've both right. been elected. You know how to turn a crowd on. Not much pizzazz there, was there? Not much connection no, chemistry, not, was it? Not at no, all. and that's been the problem. And yeah. people have wondered what has taken so long if you were so concerned about the citizens of Flint. One of the things that we've said is, you know, uh, look at what Senator Stabenow has done. She has worked in the Michigan delegation, but they have worked tirelessly and effortlessly, and she has yeah. worked across the aisle to, to get with Republicans to help get this passed through the Senate. If he is very concerned, as he says he is, then we need him to do that same right. thing. You know, so what do people in that church, it's a black church, what do they think when it guy shows up uh, a couple weeks before the election they'd never met before right and, and that was the question what took you, you know, so long you know where what? have you been he's irrelevant in exactly. terms of helping Flint and in, in, in Flint people you know it, it means nothing that he's there I think, though, it's important to say that when he talks about who he's attacking for this problem, yeah. he's attacking a Republican governor who ran as a businessman who'd never been involved okay. in government, just like okay. Donald Let me ask you Trump. both a question. Why is Michigan so strongly and solidly Democrat? Because I'm looking at Pennsylvania. Maybe on the best day of his life, Trump can win there. I don't, think, I don't believe he won't. Same with Virginia. Uh, he may carry Ohio. That's more Republican. He may carry North Carolina. It's more conservative. He may carry Florida. But Michigan's almost untouchable. Why for a Republican? Well, first of all, uh, Michigan, Michigan understands what President Obama has done with the auto industry, what we need in terms of... Well, Mitt Romney of, gave up on it. Well, right. he, he said let it go bankrupt. So did yeah. Donald Trump. He said let them go bankrupt. And by the way, I'll... Did Donald I will, Trump say let it go bankrupt too? Yeah. Okay. And, and by the way... When he talks about trade, I'll take him seriously when he stops making his ties in China and his suits in Mexico and his furniture in Turkey and everything else. And so, you know, there, he has no credibility when it comes to okay. jobs. Thank you, guys. Thank you for both coming on. And you start with McKay. What do you make of this? Uh, well, let's go to this substance. What do you think the power of this news is that probably the most respected? Well, let me just put it the leading light. African-American, certainly in the Republican Party, the one that everybody in the country seems to trust, not just in that party, but one of our really renowned leaders in this country, was so open in his secret private correspondence about what he thinks of Donald Trump, what he thinks of birtherism, calling him racist, and what he calls Hillary Clinton, greedy. <laughs> well, it certainly is not good for Donald Trump, first of all. I mean, look, you're right that this is somebody who is considered a statesman by a large swath of the country. And the fact that he has not up until now inserted himself publicly into the presidential election very much adds, I think, gravity to his criticism of Trump and the birther movement as as a racist. I think that the, the fact that he is so you know, viciously critical of Trump in these private emails suggests that this is not this is not partisan positioning or posturing. This is what he really feels about his party's nominee. OK, let me go to Caddy, because, you know, we all watch uh, Colin Powell all the time for signs. He's sort of the one back in 08 went for Obama, 012 went for Obama. He said, well, that's going to matter with moderate Republicans. This guy's voice matters. Yeah, it does matter. And in these emails as well that have been leaked, he also talks about people in the Republican Party as idiots, says that the, the party is... The Chinese. Uh, the Chinese talks about. He also says that the party has left him a long time ago. And he's pretty scathing about the Republican Party as well in an email, for example, to his daughter. Uh, I, 
I actually think that the more surprising thing in these email leaks is what he says about Hillary Clinton, who he says is a friend of his, but then goes on to say that she's greedy, not transformational, and overly ambitious. That's pretty he damning. He said something about her hubris, too. Like, it's like... That she has no hubris, that she, oh, that she, tr she ruins everything through her hubris. Messes up everything. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I would be, I mean, I'm surprised that he is that critical of Hillary Clinton on email. I think everybody in Washington now is learning what you say on email yeah. is probably going to be public fairly soon. It's almost like mind reading Russian because, hackers. Is, isn't it funny, McKay, because I'm like most people in this, I have a certain view of the guy, I treat him like almost like an older brother, not that much older, but I got to tell you, I look, at him, I look up to the guy. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he did, I, I think he got bamboozled by the bad guys going into Iraq war and he should have, but he's more of a salute guy, you know, than a politician. Right. But I do think when you hear that he thinks the Chinese are as bad as I think they are, that makes me happy. That makes me mirthful because <laughs> well, I know who they are. I think they're the biggest hawks in the world. But, you know, here's a guy who uh, is not he's a soldier, a general, and he believes you get into wars when you have to and you figure out a way to get out of them before you go in them. Common sense. Yeah, right. And, well, I think it's interesting the way that he, he attacks the Cheneys. He says they're idiots. Uh, he, he's criticized. He was criticizing the book that he, uh, Dick and, and Liz Cheney wrote together. Uh, he also takes on um, Rumsfeld. Uh, he and Condi Rice are actually in private emails between each other. Uh, they, they say uh, Rumsfeld and the Pentagon messed up the nation building after uh, after the invasion of Iraq. Uh, he, he says the, the boys in the band were brain dead. That's one comment that Powell mm -hmm. makes. It's such a great idea to begin with. I mean, give me a break. The whole idea we're going to recreate. We're trying to figure out Newark and Detroit. And we're, we're got a lot of cities we're working on this kind. Oh, we're going to go rebuild Baghdad to our liking. Let me ask you this about this election. This is a Chinese water torture. This is slow leaking, 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 leaking. And nobody thinks it's going to stop till election day. Are we going to get some incredible, you know, wow stuff coming in, holy cow stuff coming in in October? We don't know exactly what's coming. We know what Colin Powell has said today, that there is a lot more out there. We know that Julian Assange has said that just ahead of the first debate, he is going to release more stuff about yeah. Hillary Clinton. So one can only assume that. And I think that's the biggest story here, isn't it, Chris? It's not the inside beltway of who yeah. said what, because so far there have been no stunning surprises yeah. in the leaked emails. But even, at the, even at the DNC Confirmations, not surprises. Confirmations of things right. that you and I might have suspected. Okay. But there is a real attack going on. we got an on. expert with us. McKay, you know what's going on more than either of us know. We're just sort of mainstream types here. Do you think there's going to be a real waterfall coming in between a surpri uh, October surprise of information from the email train? I mean, look, I don't see how there couldn't be. I have to say, look, you have Julian Assange, you have the Russian hackers, you have all these people saying, promising to deliver more. They're not bluffing. And I think that the fact that even Colin Powell is saying that the hackers have a lot more suggests that he's nervous about what's still going to come out. I mean, look, yeah. my colleagues at BuzzFeed are still sifting through the emails that DC Leaks is, all, is providing right now. There could be many, many more in the coming weeks. And I think that both campaigns need to be ready for that. Well, I'll be popping in at midnight looking on my my phone to find out what's new. Anyway, thank you, McKay Cobbins, for coming in. Kelly K, thanks for coming back. Okay, I want to talk I about taxes. taxes. Stay That's on I taxes. Well, I will stay on what taxes. What is Trump hiding? I think one of three things, if not all three things. He may not make as much money as you would think a 10 billionaire would. Yeah. He may not pay a high tax rate or even a modest tax rate. He may so have make you know huge what would deductions. Hurt him? And he may not give anything to charity, yeah, which right. was even from his foundation. Why do you think Trump's hiding it? I don't necessarily know that Mr. Trump is hiding it. I think he's, he's not releasing he's not. it. I think what he, he could release President it Obama he said yesterday he's hiding his tax well, just because you got a better phrase just for because it? President Obama he says something that's his that's taxes. Is he I not hiding it? Mr. Trump has said that after his audit is done, he will release the tax. He releases How do you know he's having an audit right now? We, why do we have to assume everything he says is not true? Not let's, let's, let's take why, what he said well, is true. Why does he have to wait for the audit to end? Richard Nixon, because the, Richard because Nixon had an audit. You said it's a choice. You know it's a choice. You know why it's a choice? 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 He'll release his taxes if he'll release their medical information. Well, you know what? So it's up to him, and he's chosen not to do it. That's what I'm saying. I think he said that after the audit is complete, he will release it. And we should take it back. Well, if he doesn't release it before, couldn't anybody running for president say the same thing? They surely could. And, if he and, doesn't and release could, it before could, they, the election, it's meaningless. This, the, the only point to release these taxes yeah. is to let people know very important details about a guy who wants to have his finger on the nuclear button. If he, he can release it if he wants to. The guy Nixon does, was under it. Okay, he, Governor, he Governor Pence released his tax records, and what did that tell you? 
Well, his but, well, no, I, no, Governor Pence his life is a lot different. Well, had he it asked was because it was a choice and because he decided well, wait a second, to do that, he, probably because he wasn't okay. on. Wait a second, when he and it didn't tell us anything. When Pence, it did not tell us anything about his It did not tell us anything about how he lead. It did not tell us anything about his ability to be president or the vice when, president. When so Pence, it's a choice. What would you Pence, say, if, Chris? When Pence was being vetted by Donald Trump, he gave Donald Trump his tax returns. So Donald Trump says it's good enough for me that I need to know about your tax returns, but Donald Trump tells the American public, forget about it, that's not I do said. not have to give it that's to you. That's not what he said. I do not have to, he, he Let's be say, honest, he said not, after the audit no, that I will release the tax returns. That is the biggest BS, he's, he's an, ex, that's an excuse. What he said. Who's auditing him? I don't know the auditors. I don't what, what institution? Uh, what, whoever audited He could people. get taxes from five years ago. He could do this. It's his decision. He's hiding behind the audit as an excuse. That is clear to anyone well, who pays attention. Well, he can certainly document the fact he's having an audit right now if he wanted to. He certainly could. Then you, do you accept my rule of politics? It's this. If, it, if it's better than it looks, they'll show you. If it's worse than it looks, they won't. I think that's, that's what politicians do. Yeah. They show you anything that makes them look better, hide anything that makes them look worse. That's what politicians do. I just think that anybody that keeps away from the public something that they're proud to show tells me that they're not really proud to show it. What? There's too much information here that he probably can't put up with. Otherwise, you're right. He'd get it out. And he could even give us the first page, how much you make, how much you paid, and how much you gave to charity. He doesn't have to give us anyway, all his pages. Yeah, I mean, think he says the Clinton campaign. Not about taxes. And then, and then, She's and in taxes for 30 years. And deleting emails and, and, and all the of the things that they've done. Anyway, I think now. it's, it's, I think it's common practice right now to show your tax returns. I gave Bernie's people a hard time on this. And I, yeah. I don't be consistent And we should take Mr. Trump at his word that after the audit he will do it. Let's just do that. You're taking him at his word there is an audit. I, I do. I happen to trust that's public officials. I happen to trust our, our right, leaders. Thank that's you. And crazy. I want to trust them. That's crazy okay, to wait that you. long. We'll be right back. Actually, David Coyne, thank you. Who doesn't trust? And I don't trust I don't trust any like of them. I want to see. Paris Denard, thank you for coming on. A very trusting man, I think. We haven't had this much trust here in a long I time. I trust you too, Okay. Chris. Well, in this case, you're right. Hi, doctor, I've got three questions. What's new here? What's uh, important here? And what's missing? And what's new here, we'll start with Hillary Clinton. What's new here is we're finding out a little more information. And her doctors released two letters over the last few months. And in those two letters, we're getting more of an idea, more of a picture of what's going on with her health. In this latest letter, what's new is we're finding out again, like you mentioned, good mental health. She has excellent mental health. Also, we find out about her vaccinations. And we find out about some of the testing that went on with the pneumonia that she had and how it was a mild pneumonia that she's on antibiotics for. She seems to be recovering from. And like you said, she's resting right now. There are a few pieces missing in there, but those pieces I think are minor and I think are small pieces. On Donald Trump's end, what we're finding out is that we don't have a lot of things that we know about. And there's a lot of pieces to the picture that are still missing, and we need to get some of those filled in. You know, Dr. Oz saw, had this thing on his show that he came on and showed us a little bit of information of what he's going to show tomorrow. Hopefully we find out more information about that. Let's talk about that, uh, Secretary Clinton here. Uh, I'm, trying, I'm not a doctor, obviously, and I'm trying to figure out from what others have reported here. Uh, this Sunday, Hillary Clinton had a, a spate or a, a spat of dehydration. Fair enough. It was a hot day. A lot of people were, needed more uh, near hydration, near, near water. They weren't drinking enough water. She wasn't drinking enough. That led to a fainting and it led to her being helped into the car in a near collapse situation. In 2012, another case of dehydration leading to fainting. In that case, it led to her falling and having a concussion and then the blood clot. So was this a case on Sunday that if somebody wasn't there to catch her, that she would have fallen and potentially suffered the same uh, reaction, which is a concussion, as we went, she went through before? Dehydration, fainting, concussion. What does that pattern tell you? Well, it tells me a couple of things. One, it tells me that she doesn't take very good care of herself, especially when she's on the campaign trail and she works you know, extra hard, like she says, but she's not drinking the water and she's not listening to her doctor as far as you need some days of rest to make sure you get over this. She's getting out there and trying to do these things. The other thing it tells me is that you know, from the tests she's had in the past, especially the tests concerning the blood clots, it looks like they've done a fairly full evaluation of those. She's on blood thinning medication for that right now. You know, the concern there, if she does hit her head, it makes it more likely that she could bleed in that area. So you have to be extra careful with that. So again, I think my main message for her would be, you know, listen to your doctor, take better care of yourself before you go out and hit the campaign trail. And I do understand this is hot and heavy season right now in the campaign, yeah. but still have to take care of yourself. So the blood clots are what they, t because that's the phrase that grabs me, blood clots. Is this something that's uh, chronic now? 
it's something that she's had three different episodes of these blood clots. She's on a blood thinning medicine. That's the Coumadin the doctor talks about in the yeah. letter. The blood thinning medication prevents other blood clots from coming on or forming, yeah. assuming she's at the right levels. They seem okay. to be checking her levels. They also, in the, subs in the earlier letter, talked about she doesn't have any. She did what's called anticoagulation studies, meaning where they're looking, they looking for syndromes that might cause her to coagulate a little more to get these blood clots. They didn't find any of those. Okay. And so we still don't have an understanding of why she's getting these blood clots, and we may never because science hasn't advanced that far. But they're on the, she's on the medicine now she needs to be on to prevent that from happening. What about Trump's doctor? I mean, you can't call somebody a quack. But for to say that he's the healthiest person ever to run for president is, is certainly meaningless, undocumentable. There's no medicine equivalent to what we have today 200 years ago. We can't go back and check John Quincy Adams to see how he is in this head-to-head -head race. It's an absurdity to say he's the healthiest guy to run for president. And and a, he's got a, all that long hair. He looks a little bit strange. <laughs> what do you make of a doctor who comes out and says healthiest guy in history? Well, well, from he's a medical leaning on his arm. Right. He's leaning on his arm while he's talking for some weird reason. Exactly. From a medical perspective, if he came to me, if I called him and said, I have this new patient, his name's Donald Trump, Tell me what he's like. And he says he's the healthiest person I've ever seen. I'm like, okay, that doesn't tell me a single thing. Give me some more information. Give me some yeah. background. Give what me some history. What do you got from Trump right now, from what we've got publicly? Well, we have he's basically. He's a little overweight, 230-something. Uh, I right. don't know what else. Uh, he's overweight. The 230 puts him in a, an overweight category, bordering on obese category. So I don't know that I call him a healthy weight. We don't know much about his history beyond that, though. We know that he's on an aspirin. He takes that every day. Why does he take the aspirin? Is it preventative? Did he have issues in the past? We don't know a lot of his picture. And that's probably the biggest concerning thing here is that I talk about it being a puzzle. We have all these pieces we put together. In yeah. his case, we have a couple of pieces of a large puzzle that we haven't okay. been able to put the rest of the pieces together to get a complete picture. Okay, thank you so much. You're a great guest to have on, Dr. J uh, John Torres, for coming on. What is Bill Clinton, the man who revolutionized what it means to have a post-presidency, really up to day-to-day -to -day right now? I find that question somewhat fascinating. The former president, possibly the next first gentleman in the United States, sat down with the author Joe Connison for multiple interviews for Connison's brand new book, Man of the World. Connison gained access not only to the former president, Bill Clinton, but also to Hillary Clinton, daughter Chelsea, friends, colleagues, aides, and supporters. He got in the door. Joe Connison joins us right now. Joe, thank Thank you. Good luck with this book out there now. It's a nice cover, although his head's cut off. It's a strange thing at the top. Let me ask you about uh, Bill Clinton. And this is something that's just totally People Magazine stuff. Yeah. What is he? What is, he's been out of office 15 years. He's still a young guy by Trump's presidential standards. He's still generally healthy, it seems. What does he do every morning? Does he, does an alarm clock go off? Does he get up and do, go to office? Does he take a shower, have breakfast, like everybody else, go to work? I think his, what does he I do think every the days, day? The days are different, Chris. You know, there are travel days for him, I, I, especially in the campaign season. He's traveling around the country a lot now for uh, Hillary's campaign. Yeah, yeah. There are, I think, work days at the foundation, especially now because, uh, as I said in the in the book. They've been considering for months what to do if she does become president with the foundation. They know they well, have to. What does work mean for Bill Clinton? Work. When he says, I've got to go to work today, what does that mean? Well, work, work means um, the work of the foundation, overseeing the work of the foundation. It means uh, at different times it's meant things like writing books. You know, yeah. uh, you know what that's like. You sit in a room and he's usually working with an aide doing something like that. Uh, work yeah. means going out and and raising the money for the foundation. They raised, uh, you know, a fa an endowment that's a quarter of a billion dollars over the last few years. So there's yeah. a lot of different kinds of work. Um, well, well, you know, I, I just did some checking. Um, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton together have ran in 18 elections, actual right. elections, November, right. you know, the whole thing, campaign, yeah. do the whole thing. 18 elections, starting when he ran for Congress out in, out in uh, Arkansas, then he ran for attorney general, then he right. ran for governor, and he lost, and he ran one five times in a row, then he ran for president a couple of times. He won both times. Hillary Clinton has won now for Senate twice. He's run, ran for president this the second time now. They both, I think, right. ran for student office. What drives them in terms of elections? Why do they run so often? What drives them to run as politicians for their whole lives, really? I think... Uh... You know, I don't have a cynical view of them. I think they really want to change the world. I think they've wanted that since they were kids. And it goes through uh, various permutations of what kind of change they think should happen and uh, at what uh, pace and in what ways. But I think they've always felt they wanted to uh, make things better. And I think they like the, the power and the, yeah. uh, you know, that he likes campaigning. She's, I think he does. you know, as you know, 
Uh, she's wonkish. She likes the issues. She likes the study. She likes to get into it. She's not a natural campaigner the way he is. Yeah. But I think they both find aspects of politics that are rewarding to them. Well, he's an interesting guy. You've written an interesting book, Man of the World. That's your book. Good luck with the book. Joe Connison. Let's watch how Tim Kaine today cited Pence's, Governor Pence's comments about David Duke to defend his running mate. Here's Kaine. Just in the last couple of days, Trump has been going after Hillary because she gave a speech calling out deplorable comments. You know, she advanced the notion that if you're chumming around with the head of the Ku Klux Klan or people that have that tie, that's deplorable. You got to call that out. If you can't call it out and you stand back in your silence around it, you're enabling it to grow. You're enabling it to become more powerful. We want to be a nation of the positive virtues, not the dark emotions and not the negative virtues. Well, I'm joined right now by MSNBC political analyst Michael Steele, former chair of the RNC, the Republican National Committee, as well as former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granham, who's a senior advisor to the pro Hillary Clinton group, the Super PAC. Correct the record. Uh, you first, Governor. Who's winning on this one? Because it is the turf. If you're a progressive, you don't like you especially mm -hmm. want to go after the alt right. So the president today suggested this defines the character of a nation. This is really a debate about who we are. So if 87 percent of Trump's supporters believe that Muslims should be banned from this country, which they do, if, if uh, 65 percent of a lot of them of think Trump's, Obama's a Muslim. Right. 65 percent think that, that Obama's a Muslim. They should be banned. And 59 percent believe that he was not born in this country. And 50 percent believe that blacks and immigrants are more prone to criminality. Mm. That, that, um, the strain you mean that by has their nature, been, they're, they're bent uh, towards crime. The, bent, right, yeah. bent toward crime, right, yeah. by virtue of, of being African-American yeah. or an immigrant. Right. The point is that he has given this, this movement some voice, some life, mm. and that, to me, is really, and to her, is a fundamental issue of who we are, because that's not America. And to say that's not acceptable is that's really it. important. Michael, your views. No, I, I think from a political standpoint, this, this uh, is advantage Trump because I think it's a reflection of a lot of, it's not just Republicans, although they like to cite those polls, I would say this is a broad swath of Americans who have this view. Again, when the national poll was taken uh, over the summer, 56% of American people, white, black, Hispanic, Republican, Democrat, said that Islam was not compatible with American yeah. values. So there is this undercurrent uh, that, has a, that has attached itself to some degree uh, to the campaign. I think when it comes to the David Dukes of the world, the campaign has certainly recently been much more emphatic about it, but I think uh, against it. But I think the reality still plays to the to the undercard here that this is a topic that still resonates with a lot of people. When you give a context with respect to how you talk to the American people about this, uh, and when you start blaming them and, and laying this out but at their footsteps, th at their foot I just want to know. I mean, do you think you would say David Duke is deplorable? I would say David David Duke is is just un-America. It's un-American. But why it, wouldn't just, you use that word? Okay, because okay, it's you, Hillary's word. Because it's Hillary's word. Would why? you say that Hitler's deplorable? I, I, I would use something I mean, far worse that I can't say on national right, television. Okay. Well, Right. Right. I mean, let's talk about this one. <laughs> this is what I find, uh, not mystifying, but I don't know. This country had 250 years of slavery, legalized slavery. Yes. Before we have the, even we had a country we had slavery. We had 150 years or 100 years of Jim Crow. We had whatever's been since, which hasn't been exactly perfect on racial right. stuff. And now we have a party, uh, two parties arguing over who's better on race. It just strikes me as odd that one party says we're Simon Pure Perfect, the other side's no damn good. And, and, that's and, I, and I wonder about that. I don't think it's I don't think it's true. I don't oh, think people are that simple. Absolutely. And I certainly don't think partisan label defines your views about humanity. Absolutely right. And, and you, on all three of those points, you are spot on. Because this, this type of discussion becomes a sidebar discussion because it doesn't go to what you actually articulated at the very beginning, the underlying current of who we are as, as American citizens. When you start, when you pull it into the political, yeah. then, it becomes, then it becomes a partisan discussion. But that's the, that, the whole point is that this is not about but she the didn't Republican elevate Party. No, no, no. It's not about the Republican Party. That. There is a slice of Trump voters that go way beyond what the Republican Party would ever stand for, the so, party of Lincoln. So let me ask you, so so that's let me, her so point. Let me ask you Governor, how then do, should I react as a black man running for the United States Senate in 2006? 
when I'm called an Uncle Tom by, by a sitting member of the state legislature, a Democrat in my state, a sitting member of the United but States that's Congress. My point. Well, this no. is my point. This is my point. Y you want to sit there and slide this off into one side, side of the political pie. What I'm saying is this speaks to a broader problem that we have in this country. And when you bring it into the political context, you lose sight of the reality that we all deal with every day. I don't look at this. When, when Hillary Clinton said that I didn't put it in political context, yeah. I said, you, you're now talking about a, a, a broad swath of the American people, and that's going to be the problem, not whether it's Republican I, or Democrat. I, I, listen, I don't disagree with you at all. My point is saying that this swath, whatever that is, that right. unacceptable swath, you could say they're Democrats, independents, or Republicans, but they have attached themselves to Donald Trump, and that's the problem. Should Hillary Clinton he have has... said to Kennedy that there's a, a basket, I don't even like the word basket of people, it's like binders of women, remember that? Right. right. I, right. I, I remember right. that. Basket of deplorables, half that, whatever the percentage she said she meant to say, she said half. Is that fair? No. No, and she said, she, she came said back a quarter, said, was that fair? No, I mean, I don't know. Why what, is she putting a number on it? Before, she had previously said there are two groups and not putting a number on it. But the point is, and she apologized. Do you think for it had anything to do with her health? Because no. they, they put that in the paper today. Somebody put it out that it was a bad weekend for she. No. In other words, if she'd taken the rest, if she she'd rested the last all weekend, she would have to use health to excuse that. No, no, no. I think I don't it's know, just I don't a mistake. Who knows, by the you way? Know, she had previously Nobody said knows. two groups, and she misspoke, mm -hmm. and she apologized. But, but the point being. If she had being, said a fifth, if she had said a uh, fifth, whatever, I, I have it. But no, but the very fact that you're using the phrase basket of deplorables, I wonder where the phrase itself is troubling to a lot of people. It is troubling to me because even when you say two groups, I don't care how you cut it. That's 50%. Yeah. When you oh, say no, there are two, not, well, I mean, it is. If I say there are two groups that support you, that, that means, you How know, big are they? Well, right? I mean, right, but I'm just point, saying. The point but, is that, the point is that yes. this, yeah, okay. this strain of thought okay. is Trump's strain of I've been thought. To figure, that's I've, a I've been trying to figure out, Governor America. Mike, I've been trying to figure out, Governor as well, Lieutenant Governor, I've been trying to figure out if there's an alternative, like everything, I always try to figure out. Suppose a, a Republican said this about a Democrat, and I keep thinking, what would be the worst thing to say about Democrats? Half that party are socialists. I go, wait a minute, that's not so bad. <laughs> the Democrats wouldn't be offended by that. So I'm not sure what you can call people on the left. What would you say? Well, I, what would well, be the Deplorables on the I, left. To you. I think. I what think, would you say? A bunch of Democrats are deplorables. What would you mean? I, I would think that left from my perspective. Be careful. No, I'm, no, I would be careful. <laughs> left no, I would just say no. I think we, we tend to look at this thing through just one lens, and my argument would be that this cuts on both sides. Yeah. You don't sit there and act like there aren't racist a people yeah. on the Democratic side Absolutely. because that's, I know, that's. I agree with you on that. That's the bigger I point. I agree with you on that. But the Washington that's Post poll, the poll today is, uh, said 60 percent of Americans think that Trump yeah. is is not a bigot. What did they say? 60 percent believe that he has, is he's, biased. He's biased. That's yeah, right. Biased that's right. against uh, African you know Americans what? and women. I still got a problem with Trump on that. Well, not on his personal view of people, which I don't know what that is. But why he calls the first African American president some sort of usurper? Right. He's got right. to get past right. that before election day. And if that doesn't come up in the debates, I'll be amazed. No, he does. It's because you cannot, you cannot have a conversation. You might as well get it behind him now. If I were him, get it behind you now. Right. Come on here and get it behind you. Right. Michael Steele, Jennifer Graham. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Grand Hall. <laughs> Great guess. What is it? Who's going to win? Who's term? My theory is topic decides who wins. No matter what the argument is, if you're on certain topics, it decides who wins. What's your view of this one? Racism, all the other isms that Hillary Clinton mentioned on Friday and how many Trump people make the description. Chris, talking to Clinton allies, Clinton advisors, there's a sense that the more they can bring the alternative right into the national debate, Clinton's on good footing. They want to have that conversation in these final seven, eight weeks of the campaign. But the other school of thought is when you talk to the Trump people, they think they, this reinforces Trump's pitch as some kind of anti-establishment force in American politics, us versus them, almost a Spiro Agnew, Richard Nixon type vibe going yeah. on with the Trump uh, argument. Who's right? I think right now, who's most convinced they're right? I, I, I want to ask you a fair reporter's question. From talking to these people, who's the most cocksure that talking about deplorables and who called who deplorable is a victory for which side? It depends on how the suburban voters swing. This is where this is all targeted. If you're in North Carolina and that research triangle, if you're in Ohio or Pennsylvania, how do you hear this kind of debate? When you hear deplorables, does it scare you away from the Trump campaign? Do you get skittish? Or does it, does it make Hillary Clinton, the, the secretary's campaign, feel like something that you can't be part of? Yeah, well, thank you much, Robert Costa. Great reporting. We're always watching you, sir.